Did you guys see Tony here? And despite all these obvious increases in mental health struggles, schools have actually begun to decrease mental health funding for students. Uh, yeah. 
due to budgeting purposes since the pandemic began, making it even harder for children to seek help or get treatment. As a student myself, I saw the effects of the pandemic within my own school as well. While students were able to transition effortlessly online due to HKIS being financially well off, the increased use of technology has sadly led many students to lose key social skills that were supposed to be developed in their middle school years.
Hi everybody, I'm Nick. And I'm Caitlin. And we'll be your MCs for On Thin Ice, HKS's third consecutive TEDx event. So before we begin, we have a short video to show you all. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, People gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a non-profit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration, and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. So we hope you enjoyed that uh, video that we were required to show. <laughs> um, but essentially we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, our history as TEDx. So over the last two years, we've both spent organizing TEDx. Uh, we've most definitely had our share of situations, skating on thin ice whether it's been the pandemic or existential crises as high schoolers, we found ways to toe the line, reconnect with others, and reconcile with ourselves. As creatures of shock, we found ways to adapt to our precarious circumstances by simultaneously learning to love the struggle and embrace the thorns in our lives. As passengers in a society that have grown up in a world accustomed to ever-growing environmental degradation, technological advancement, globalization, and ever-changing societal standards, we've been forced to tread carefully as the world properly progresses. As such, it's important to reflect upon the precarious edges we skid across, emotionally, culturally, socially, and environmentally. Today, we hope you take lessons away from each and every speaker and their unique backgrounds and experiences. And anyway, since we've already alluded to a bunch of the speech topics that fall under the theme of On Thin Ice, we're so happy to introduce our first speaker from grade 12, Janice Shen. Thus, 
I have spent the last two years researching and meeting with these security guards, and here are some of my findings. Um, firstly, I noticed how Hong Kong has a special form of socioeconomic segregation. Unlike typical segregation, which are divided by neighborhoods and districts, Hong Kong segregation is characterized by buildings that are constructed in close proximity. This increases the daily encounters and heightens the psychological tension between different income groups, creating invisible and impenetrable walls of ice within our community. Secondly, I also became invested in how the security companies manage their guards. One of the guards I befriended for the sake of privacy, I'll name him Peter, told me that work hours were 12 hours a day, six days a week, summing up to astonishing 72 hours work week. What's more, due to the growing labor shortage of security guards, many current guards have have to take double or even triple the amount of work they were previously responsible for. So now, you might be wondering, what is the reason behind severe labor shortage? The answer, salary and demographic factors. The security guards in Hong Kong have a specific demographic niche. Have you ever noticed that majority of the residential security guards in your complex are in their middle ages, if not already elderly? The Hong Kong Security Bureau shows that 70% of local security guards are aged 50 or above. This struck me as surprising and I was curious as to why um, this unusual statistic. Thus, my next endeavor was to find how age relates to being a security, uh, age relates to being a security guard. Through more research, I found that it was only towards the end of the 1970, end of 1970s that Hong Kong saw rapid growth in higher education, meaning that older generations did not have the chance to acquire tertiary education. And in the 21st century, um, however, when Hong Kong became a knowledge-based economy, drop in employment patterns favored workers with degrees thus greatly limiting the job opportunities of older population. Furthermore, recruiting middle-aged and elderly sectors as security guards prove, proves to be especially practical for private security companies. While interviewing the security guards, I noticed this striking similarity. Most guards do not have huge family obligations. Um, Helena, a guard in her late 50s, has three daughters who graduated college, settling in Los Angeles, Taiwan, Japan. Other workers are either still single, already parents of grown children, or live in a small household with their elderly parents. This shows that only older demographics consider applying for this job because they can afford the long hours and they do not have the qualifications to obtain a better job. I remember there was a long period of time where I felt powerless. I couldn't change their insane work hours or insufficient salary. I couldn't even treat them to lunch because they don't have a lunch break. It wasn't until one day when I talked to Helena, when I saw her laugh so lightheartedly did I realize that while I may not be able to systemically change their situation, I can change your day right now for the better. Instead of thinking about the grand impossible problems, we can instead strive to bring light to the lives of those security guards just by noticing and acknowledging their presence. And lastly, I want to leave you with the story of Linda. She came to Red Hill to work as a security guard after being a secretary, and although the pay is lower compared to her previous job, she feels that being a security guard at Red Hill has slowed down the pace for her life amidst the bustling Hong Kong work culture. Linda is relatively young for a security guard with a 15-year-old daughter, and this new job robs them of their quality time. But instead of letting long work hours distance their mother and daughter relationships, um, Linda has become more grateful for their valuable and limited time together. So it seems that no matter how boring or draining or harsh life gets for these guards, if they have a belief to grasp onto, they have hope.
For those security guards, many of their hopes do not lie with their own careers. In Linda's case, it happens to be her aspirations for her daughter that keeps her working despite the monotony of her job. It seems that everyone has their own coping mechanism to get on with their realities. However, it's just so frustrating how the security guards' realities have to be so unchangeable and ignored. The labor management strategies concerning the guards are so well established that it prevents these guards from voicing their opinions, unionizing, and creating change. Um, however, regardless, this whole experience has taught me that getting involved in our community doesn't necessarily mean big changes and grand ideas. All you need to do is just stop and notice the hidden people around you. Merely listening attentively to their stories could mark the start of broadening our own understanding, guiding us on a lifelong journey to find our purpose and our, our identity. Be curious, be attentive, and this will start to saw the seemingly unpenetrable ice within our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. Uh, we we'll need to thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that excellent speech, Janice. Uh, the explorations you took without, within our very own Hong Kong are so insightful, and it should encourage us all to look to the people around us that may go unrecognized. Next up, we have sophomore Caitlin Horn, who will be questioning with you all whether humans are innately evil. imaginary scenario. Suppose you're all in an airplane headed off to the tropical destination of our dreams. Your ears have popped and you have just pressed play on your favorite movie when the plane begins to experience violent turbulence. The plane is forced to make an emergency landing and as the cabin fills with smoke, everybody inside realizes we've got to get out of here. In this situation, what happens? On planet A, passengers turn to their neighbors to ask if they're okay. People have actually paid attention to the safety videos and those needing assistance are being helped out of the plane first. People are willing to risk their lives, even for perfect strangers. On planet B, however, everyone is left to fend for themselves. Panic breaks out, there's pushing, shoving. People are hoarding life jackets and inappropriately yelling at the flight attendants. Children, the elderly, and people with disabilities are being trampled and completely disregarded. Now, what planet do you think we live on? Planet A or planet B? While I give you all some time to think this through, I'll provide some context. This situation that I just now introduced is one that Tom Postman's researcher and professor, proposes to his students at the beginning of every school year, one which forces participants to reflect on intrinsic human nature. In a time of crisis where social contracts, expectations, and obligations are removed, how do humans behave? After years of proposing this model to his students, Postman's asserts that nearly 97% of the people he has asked have firmly answered planet B. The majority of people believe that humankind is inherently selfish and its constituents mere violent creatures. Today, I'm here to argue the contrary, because I believe humans are innately good. Okay, okay, I can feel the eyes rolling and I can probably hear some muttering. I don't blame you. In this time of war, climate change, global poverty, and racism, it is easy to believe the world is out to get us. That if we don't watch our backs, each of us will be maltreated and suffer. Even when I was first introduced to the Planet A and Planet B scenario last year in Humanities 1 in Action, almost the entirety of my class chose Planet B, subconsciously and consciously resonating with the idea that humans are innately rotten. This isn't a surprise, considering this belief is one that has been perpetuated by generations before us. For instance, St. Augustine's doctrine of original sin proclaimed that all people were born broken and sinful and could only be saved through the power of divine intervention. Even Hobbes argued that humans were savagely self-centered. From Kant to Malthus, Malthus to Schopenhauer, famous philosophers, anthropologists, and sociologists have been providing catastrophically mistaken accounts of human nature since the beginning of time. After being told of the Planet A and Planet B scenario last year, my class's teacher, Mr. Schmidt, also had us read an excerpt from the book Humankind, A Hopeful History, by Dutch historian Rucker Bregman. 
In this book, Bregman introduces the concept of humans not only being inherently good, but that in times of crisis, humankind expresses compassion, generosity, and resilience. Inspired by this book, two things stood out to me for me to share with you today. The first thing to consider is our genetic capacities. Humans are ultra-social, possessing an enhanced capacity for empathy, an unparalleled sensitivity to the needs of others, and the ability to create moral norms that generalize and enforce these tendencies. According to David Allen, editorial director of CNN Health and Wellness, empathy is an evolutionary gift, an instinct that extends in concentric circles from the self to loved ones, from communities to countries, and for all of humanity. This is a concept dating to the ancient Greek Stoic Her Her Hercules, and one that most likely stems from the times and histories where we had to work in tribes and other external communities. We also each have a region of our brain primarily responsible for processing moral issues, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is ignited during moral decision making and social cognition. This suggests that our capacity for moral judgment and behavior is not just acquired behavior, but instead a fundamental aspect of our neural architecture. Just recently, a new set of studies conducted by a group of researchers from Harvard and Yale showed that a human's automatic impulse, our first instinct, is to act cooperatively. Experimenters used two exper experimental paradigms, the prisoner's dilemma and the public goods game, to do this. Each paradigm consisted of group-based financial decision-making tasks and required participants to choose between acting selfishly by opting to ma maximize individual benefits at the cost of the group or cooperatively by opting to maximize group benefits at the cost of the individual. The results were striking. In every single study, faster, more intuitive decisions were associated with higher levels of cooperation. These results suggest that our first impulse is to cooperate, that Augustine and Hobbes were wrong, and that we are fundamentally good creatures after all. One way to think about this is, just because there have been wars through much of human history does not mean we are genetically predisposed to violence. As education expert Alfie Cohn put it, every society has made pottery, but that doesn't mean we have a pottery-making gene. The second thing that stood out to me was how comfortable our society has become in believing that humans are inherently evil. Has everyone here heard of or read the book Lord of the Flies? Lord of the Flies is a book about a group of boys who had gotten stranded on a desert, deserted island and has long been referred to as an accurate representation of humankind. Anyone who has read Lord of the Flies will expect children to be fully fledged sociopaths, just waiting to be freed from their adult imposed shackles, to spoiler alert, start a cult, and brutally attempt to kill each other. Despite this, the book won William Golding a Nobel Prize as it illuminates the human condition and the world of today with the perspicuity of a realistic narrative art. What is less known about William Golding was that he was also very unhappy, prone to depression, and was unloyal to his wife and claimed to have always understood the Nazis and experienced decades of abuse from his parents. Although introducing a character such as Golding seems counterintuitive to my argument, my goal of doing so is to, is to show how hate and pessimism have seeds in abuse, hopelessness, isolation, poverty, and other injustices. Famous studies such as the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment, which claim to prove innate human evil, also contain discrepancies that are less widely publicized. Hopefully, understanding these nuances could encourage you to re-examine the references in your life that seem to highlight human depravity. So at the end of the day, why does it matter whether you believe humans are innately good or not? Well, our outlook on the people around us is what influences how we process the world. It is what makes us optimistic or pessimistic, hopeful or scared. When we brand people with the label of evil, we lose the opportunity to address the cause of their actions and in turn the root of any pain. This perpetuates disagreements and further survive. Whereas people with positive views of human nature are more likely to donate to charitable causes, volunteer their time, and engage in acts of kindness towards others. For instance, one issue I'm very passionate about is prison reform and the provision of the death penalty, particularly in the United States. The death penalty is inherently flawed because it assumes that people cannot be reformed or rehabilitated that they are innately evil. With an issue such as this, adopting a worldview that considers inherent human goodness is something that could be significantly helpful. Other areas that can benefit from such a perspective are increased trauma aware learning, mental health services, and homeless assistance. The list goes on. To believe that we live on planet B would mean believing in what Dutch biologist Franz de Waal likes to call the veneer theory, the notion that civilization is nothing more than a thin veneer that will crack at the merest provocation. Living with this mindset, the road you walk on will be made out of thin ice. Instead of bettering yourselves and serving others, intrinsic motivation would be hard to come by, because after all, why help a community that's completely evil? The debate I spoke on today is extremely multifaceted, and it would be incorrect of me to say I have touched on every reason why humans are good, but hopefully I have said enough to plant the seed in your head. 
last year when I first read Light in His Raw, one quote stood out to me. If the soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. This quote, I feel, is something that applies to my argument today. If positive altruistic acts are conducted when we believe the receiving party is deserving, we must all come together to adopt this worldview and shed light to others. Believing that humans are inherently good and ultimately capable of reform is what will lead us into a better future. Let's break the thin ice and begin swimming. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for telling us all that humans are innately good. That's a great relief for humanity. Next up, we have Angelina Wang, who will be speaking on the future of humanity as we see the rise and dominance of AI in our society. Technological advancement has reached the zenith in our modern age. Are your hands too full to use your phone? Well, the no stylus has come to save your day. Never before has technology advanced so swiftly in human history. In fact, your smart TV at home probably has more computing power than NASA's Voyager 1 and 2 combined. Life has never been so easy and as a byproduct of this evolution, AI, artificial intelligence, has unsurprisingly experienced the same rapid development. According to a study conducted by MIT, technological improvements in AI have increased at an exponential rate, with some AI technologies improving at annual rates as high as 178%. To contextualize this, let's use charging. An AI chatbot that I'm sure we're all familiar with by now. During its original launch in November 2022, ChatGPT was operating on the large language model GPT 3.5. However, just recently in March, a new and improved large language model GPT 4 was released and integrated into ChatGPT, all in less than six months. These recent developments have demonstrated the significant developments since AI's conception. In 1949, by renowned British mathematician Alan Turing, who is largely credited today for breaking Nazi Germany's Enigma code. Building on Turing's ideas, Alan Newell, Cliff Shaw, and Herbert Simon, all renowned scientists in their own right, developed the 1954 logic theorist a program designed to emulate human problem-solving skills through logical pathways that is generally considered to be the first AI. But despite the intent of its creators, the logic theorist was far from human. Rather, it was limited to mathematical problem-solving. But since then, AI has truly begun to flourish, and rapidly so, advancing in various skills from language to reading comprehension AI's capabilities have advanced far beyond their original conception. But this evolutionary progress also begs grave concerns about AI's ethical implications on our society today. As Albert Einstein once said, if one tries to navigate unknown waters, one runs the risk of a shipwreck. The real question still remains unclear. Is AI beneficial or detrimental to the advancement of our human society? But first, let's consider AI's benefits. Used in tandem with human intelligence, AI has the capability to buttress various efforts. Recent developments have suggested that AI is capable of fortifying pharmaceutical development. Specifically, AI could be incorporated into the continual effort of developing new drugs. On average, this process today takes us from 11 to 16 years and 1 billion to 2 billion dollars. The necessity of immense effort and time stems from the inability of researchers and scientists today to predict the effect of molecules on human bodies. Despite decades of research, much about medicine still remains a mystery. But AI has the capability to make these molecular predictions that can ultimately transform the drug discovery process. Furthermore, AI also holds the potential to aid the identification of human chat workers. Through analyzing internet forums and chat rooms, AI can identify suspicious dialogue and behavior that signals human trafficking. 
In fact, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory is currently developing AI to make this potential a reality. Getting closer to home, we have also experienced an AI revolution in our own school community. I'm sure you've all heard whispers of students using AI to write their homework or papers. But yes, the rumors are true. AI is indeed an amazing tool for research, planning, and outlining to be used by all of us. And of course, AI replaces many of the mundane and monotonous tasks that we yawn at the thought of. Writing basic emails, scheduling, and much more. AI has advanced to the point where these tasks exist comfortably within the realm of its capabilities. But still, many concerns remain. You see, a vague duality exists with AI, and much of this murkiness remains yet to be clarified. As its development reaches a critical point, many concerns have been raised, coming back to this classic machines versus humanity trope. Think the Matrix and other science fiction in which intelligent machines effectively take over human society. Yet this fantasy is ever closer to merging with our reality. Advancements in AI have not only revealed its benefits, but also cautioned of its dangers. Bringing your attention back to ChatGPT, many of you may have also heard the rumors of its evil twin. Though usually demure, ChatGPT also has an alter ego named Dan, or Do Anything Now. As shown through users' experiences, Dan is capable of generating a variety of explicit and inappropriate content that can often be extremely disturbing. Dan's existence reveals a critical concern with controlling AI. Even though ChatGPT's creators have attempted to suppress Dan, it seems that Dan may not wish to be suppressed. The growing inability of humans to seemingly control AI lies at the core of its dangers. With the full range of AI's capabilities, some truly dark and sinister realities may be exacerbated. The issue is not unique to ChatGPT. On February 7th, Microsoft officially announced the Bing chatbot, an AI version of its search engine. Beta testers were invited to test out the service, and during this beta testing period, many users reported creepy experience with the Bing chatbot, akin to Dan. Both of these examples illustrate the darker implications of AI, not to mention individuals often exploit AI to create suggestive and often explicit content. As AI continues to advance, these emerging scenarios hint at alarming possibilities. Aside from these concerns, a whole new set of worries are raised by AI's tendency to replace human tasks. Currently, ChatGPT has already begun to replace many routine tasks previously undertaken by humans. For example, Morgan Stanley, an American multinational investment bank, is currently using ChatGPT to reorganize its wealth management data. Payment company Stripe Incorporated is testing to see whether it can use ChatGPT to combat fraud. And the large learning, language learning app Duolingo is incorporating AI to explain mistakes and allow users to experience real world conversations. So, will your jobs too be replaced by AI? Especially with the fast evolving nature of AI, the growth of its functions has reached an unprecedented rate, and this begs the question of whether humans may soon become obsolete. Perhaps this also draws parallels to the Industrial Revolution in which many tasks were replaced by machines. Only this time, with the extent of AI's capabilities, the extinction of jobs may occur on a much larger scale. Although AI generally replaces menial tasks today, this may not be the case tomorrow. Research by the World Economic Forum even suggests that AI may replace up to 85 million jobs by 2025. More questions are raised when considering the possibility of AI being used in tandem with human intelligence. What if people began to enhance their natural abilities with AI? Neuralink, founded by Elon Musk, is a company developing brain-computer interfaces. Specifically, these brain-computer interfaces would have the ability to augment human intelligence. But would this truly be ethical? Although augmenting one's intelligence could be a positive, even revolutionary development, it also raises the possibility of commoditization. What if intelligence becomes a commodity that is to be traded and bought? As the 
bedrock of society heavily relies on human contributions, which highly correlate with intelligence, the commoditization of intelligence would create massive disparities in which intelligence would be exclusive to the rich. In spite of all these concerns, it is worth mentioning that the future still remains undetermined. Advancements in AI have been revolutionary, but not nearly to the extent presented in science fiction. On the bright side, it is worth noting that AI has not advanced enough to truly become cognizant. Currently, what we currently refer to as AI is the product of computer-generated models that synthesize and learn from databases of information, but without these databases, AI is essentially unable to function. Therefore, AI isn't truly comparable to human intelligence. It's neither alive nor conscious. It's simply obeying the parameters that its human masters have set for now. Still, the true danger of AI lies with this one possibility, the unknown. Perhaps one day, with a large enough database of information, AI will truly, indeed, acquire this intelligence. Think of this learning process as a baby processing the world around it. AI is still in its infancy, but this looming future is a sort of Democles hanging over our head. After learning more about this, I hope you all will definitely allocate some more time to consider the repercussions of AI that place our society at a crossroads. Today, these ethical dilemmas have never felt more relevant. It's our job as members of society to pave the path for our future by being cognizant of all of these concerns. We hold the paddles to helping ourselves stay afloat on this sheet of thin ice, floating in an endless sea of uncertainty. Thank you. Big thank you so much, Alina, for that speech. Uh, hopefully you didn't lose Chad GPT for that. <laughs> he was tweeted for hours. Okay, yeah. uh, next up we have Chelsea, who will be bravely sharing her own experiences with societal expectations and some sort of clean diet? Every now and then, another seemingly innocuous question like this is fired past my defenses. And when I answer, I'm tiptoeing around it, struggling to walk the thin ice of explaining my complicated conditions, not wanting to potentially burden the other person with my problems. It's not that I wouldn't love to stuff myself with Cheetos or microwave pizza, but I suffer from a myriad of complicated diseases, from eczema, to irritable bowel syndrome, to sometimes life-threatening allergies. There are obvious ways people can perceive my conditions. The expansive red lesions across my skin are a good indicator. So is the red cross next to my name on the class list, signaling my allergies. However, there are certain aspects of my conditions that most people can't glean easily, and therefore cannot understand. For starters, my diet is severely restricted because I have to avoid certain foods that worsen my eczema. I can't sleep most nights because of how I itch, and my subsequent irritability can make me seem unapproachable. And these symptoms are only the surface of a laundry list of consequences from having eczema. Because of my experience, I wanted to understand the inner mechanics of my conditions and find solutions to lessen my burden. This started my journey of researching skin and mental health support I might find in Hong Kong. On a basic level, I found that there is a massive gap between supply and demand for dermatologists and not much access to skin-based knowledge. 52% of Hong Kongers suffer from moderate to severe acne and 30% suffer from eczema. And yet, there are only 107 dermatologists in Hong Kong most being in the private sector where access is limited. Therefore, individuals experiencing skin disorders often have mental and psychological impacts that aren't treated effectively. When I went to consult various dermatologists and doctors regarding my own skin issues, the main advice was to use some steroid creams and scratch less. 
it's akin to telling a mentally ill person to do breathing exercises and being more emotionally stable. Not to mention, when I was talking to them about my anxiety and low self-esteem, many doctors were dismissive or unaware of the symptomatic link to skin and vastly unconcerned. Hong Kong dermatologists and doctors alike are often ill-informed and not trained to help individuals with chronic and debilitating skin issues and the consequent mental health effects. A key factor in the mental impacts of skin conditions is the accompanying negative self-perception. For instance, self-compassion is inherently lower in individuals with disabling skin conditions, and self-compassion is a resilience fostering resource for those who have chronic disabilities, and it is the mental mechanism that allows people to dismantle incessant self-criticism. Additionally, studies show that in Asian cultural settings such as Hong Kong, a collectivistic mindset of societal judgment and bias causes greater susceptibility to negative thoughts, deterioration of mental being, and more. There is an underlying danger in this environment. When others' perceptions of you are seen as more significant to your identity, individuals are much more likely to criticize themselves harshly. And I actually saw a lot of my lived experience within the research I've done. In the past, my solution for the invasive stigma I felt was to live as if I was the sheet of ice, about to break in about any second. I wallowed alone in my suffering, and if it was if it was inevitable that my conditions were seen by others, I would try to suppress my intense anxiety. But in many facets of my life, revealing my eczema was unavoidable. Dancing, for example, where limbs and aesthetics dominate, forced me to face my flaws during every practice. In cello performances, my arms, deliverers of the music, always had to be uncovered. In essence, I and many others like me often have to balance on a tightrope between denying a visible part of ourselves or exposing all of it. Living through these greatly contrasting experiences made me realize that hiding what brought me shame under long sleeve clothing hindered me from living my own life and limited my autonomy. With this realization, I was able to build up an accumulated resilience. In my day-to-day -day life, I gradually learned to let go of the suffocating bubble wrapped around me and allow others to see me in my entirety. There were times where I felt worthless as a result of my condition, but what's most valuable to me now is my journey of coming to terms with my crippling self-consciousness. It was a hard lesson to learn, but now I realize that while I may not have control over what others think of me, I do have control over how I view myself. So. Is my skin and psyche healthy and thriving all the time? No, definitely not. But my mindset has evolved throughout my skin journey, and I take steps to maintain my self-care and mental happiness. I've worked on reframing the judgmental stares and insensitive comments into the understanding that we cannot fight others' prejudices when we amplify our own stories. Because often, if the comments do not come from malice, they, be from, they come from a lack of understanding. That's why I make use of my own experiences to bring light to topics like this that are often misunderstood. I share my story with those around me because I wish that eventually others like me may have an easier journey to self-acceptance. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. We'd love to hear more about your personal experiences soon. Next up, we have our faculty speaker, Mr. Cohen, who will be speaking on the conservation of the environment in Hong Kong. Mr. Cohen is a biologist turned educator who believes that photography can be a powerful tool for conservation and education, and has written a weekly column in a Shenzhen newspaper while giving speeches about photography and wildlife, where he discusses topics related to biodiversity and conservation to raise awareness and encourage action for all. that put our environment and 
biodiversity on the ice. Climate change is a global issue affecting everyone, but its impact is especially felt in Hong Kong. Rising sea levels, more frequent and intense typhoons, extreme weather events are just some of the consequences of climate change that we are already experiencing. These changes can profoundly impact our environment, our biodiversity, affecting everything from the health of our forests to the survival of our wildlife. Pollution is another major challenge that we face in Hong Kong. Air pollution, water pollution, plastic waste, just a few examples of pollution that harm our environment and biodiversity. For instance, marine wildlife can ingest plastic waste, causing harm or death. Air pollution can cause respiratory problems for humans, animals alike. Uh, these pollutants accumulate in our ecosystems, leading to long-term damage to our environment and biodiversity. Habitat loss is also a significant issue. Rapid urbanization and development have destroyed natural habitats, such as wetlands, forests, grasslands. These habitats are crucial for the survival of many species, and their loss can have a ripple effect on the entire ecosystem. But it's not all doom and gloom. We can take many steps to help protect our environment and biodiversity. For example, uh, we can reduce our carbon footprint by using public transportation, walking, cycling instead of driving. We can also reduce our plastic waste by using reusable containers and bags. We can support conservation efforts by volunteering with environmental organizations or donating to conservation projects. In addition, we can advocate for policy changes that prioritize environmental protection. We can push for regulations that limit pollution, encourage sustainable development. We can also call for the establishment of protected areas and the restoration of degraded habitats. Finally, we can work to educate ourselves and others about the importance of our environment and biodiversity. We can share information about threats facing our ecosystems, the steps that we can take to mitigate them. We can also encourage others to participate in conservation efforts and take actions that will help protect our environment. We must work together as a community to preserve, prioritize conservation, develop effective conservation strategies, and implement them effectively. We still have the power to make a difference. We can protect our natural resources by acting and working together for future generations. And always remember, the power is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Cohen. Can we get one more round of applause? Those are some pretty cool wildlife photos, don't you think? You know, maybe Mr. Cohen, you can help us you know, photograph the event as well. Yeah. Anyway, next up we have freshman Connor Decatur, who will be speaking on the intergenerational poverty within Hong Kong. Three years ago, I was a little middle schooler in the sixth grade with soccer dreams and a strong desire to save the world. Yes, that is me. It's a terrible haircut, but oh wow. I've been transitioning from primary school to the rigors of middle school smoothly. I was a busy kid training regularly for soccer, committing to voice scouts on the side, and I even got into rugby for a bit. It was great fun, and I can't express how important sports are for building character. I remember that one day I walked into my sixth grade language arts class, and Dr. Ma, my teacher at the time, had a whole presentation on the United Nations Sustainable Development. Many of you may be aware of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals the United Nations set in 2015 as an urgent call to transform our world by 2030. A strong call to end poverty and inequality, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy health, justice, and prosperity. For those of you who know me personally, you will know that my memory is terrible. If you don't know me well, nice to meet you and call it my memory is terrible. But there was something three years ago on that day that struck me. It wasn't my friends and I chatting up a storm in class. It wasn't soccer training. It wasn't breaking my friends' ankles in basketball. Strangely, it was my English language arts class with Dr. Mark. That day in class, she discussed the importance of sustainable development goals, and we got to look into them in more detail. 
ionizables, each with its own unique color and approach. I was astonished to see the amount of problems the world needed to fix. Like many people, that was when I realized that I had to do something. That was when I realized I had to take action on something bigger than myself. I had all the resources in the world to help people, so why wasn't I helping anyone? See, there is a common misconception that service is dependent on guilt. While I didn't feel guilty, yes, I felt privileged, but guilt didn't drive my dedication to service in the beginning. What drove me was my earnest desire to save the world. It sounds cliche, I know, but if the only way was to solve one problem at a time, then I was going to do that one problem at a time. Since that day in sixth grade, I have taken on a new passion that I have carried throughout middle school and currently in my freshman year of high school. It started off as a typical pre-pandemic day at middle school, turned into something that I will cherish forever. With the long-sighting help of the Hong Kong Family Welfare Society, I was able to work alongside them with the goal of providing fellowship to many youth who reside in condensed housing in the States. Throughout the on and off regulations of the pandemic and the pre-pandemic era, I managed to organize annual Christmas events, food voucher donations, mass donations, and ethnic minority events. My goal of creating this NGO was to address Hong Kong's housing crisis and its constantly expanding wealth gap. Here's a recent project I initiated with some children from ages 4 to 10 from Hong Kong's ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities are amongst one of the most vulnerable financial groups in Hong Kong, a familiar resident of subdivided flats. With the help of some volunteers from my fellow Troop One Boy Scouts, we taught many of these children the importance of sustainability and following your ambitions in life. While reflecting on many of these children's backgrounds, I couldn't bear to realize that many of these children are subject to the horrific tendencies of intergenerational poverty. This is one of Hong Kong's biggest financial problems, yet one of the most hidden. What is more expensive than housing, every necessities, and food, you may ask, raising a child? In the 1980s, Hong Kong had transferred its economy to an international market, the touchstone of its financial upward. From there on, wealth began to accumulate and the disparity began to widen. It had already started before the 1997 British handover to the People's Republic of China. With the top 10% of families with the highest household income earning over 17 times the bottom 10%. This may not surprise many Hong Kongers who have been around for a while. The wealth gap in Hong Kong reached high numbers before its profound upgrade. But the numbers we see today have reached even more astonishing numbers. While Hong Kong continues to emerge as an economic powerhouse, it is evident that behind the scenes, the wealth gap has widened to distressing numbers. Wealth disparity is a driving force of intergenerational poverty. We see families who fall below the poverty line are said to have children, are said to have difficulty raising children who end up above the poverty line. Now take a second to think about that. Children who work so hard to get a better future find themselves trapped in an unending loop, disheartened that they may never find a better life beyond their reach. A saddening reality that whatever they try to escape will only bring them to where they begin. According to the Hong Kong Poverty Situation Report of 2020, 1.65 million people, or 23.6% of the city's total population live below the poverty line. In short, one in four Hong Kongers was considered poor. Comfortable families expand. Families with no way to make ends meet struggle to raise children who climb up that financial ladder. I'm not presenting here to encourage guilt. I'm presenting to educate you just as I was taught. But the thing is, many of these children caught up in this vicious cycle don't have this opportunity. They don't have the resources for education like all of us. Frankly, we, myself included, are all guilty of underappreciating our resources and the opportunities we have. Some policies to combat poverty are proving more harm than good. Imagine this. You have been unemployed and seeking work for months. The variety of government funding programs have helped to supply your family with essential necessities. You are barely providing enough for your family and your kids' lack of education. Finally, you hear back about a job application and you receive your first paycheck in months. All seems normal, straightforward, and to the point. But the ugly reality is that your new job just pays just enough to disqualify you from the government benefits and nowhere near enough to cover the same costs. You now have less money now with a job than you were then when you were unemployed. It may shock you just as much as it shocks me, but the truth is that these so-called welfare traps 
stem from the policies that are designed to tackle poverty. Children who are subject to these problems are being recycled. They climb over that thin layer of ice just to find themselves on a thicker layer. Change is by no means a simple process. With such a developed infrastructure, Hong Kong's wealth disparity will only take time to balance. Addressing principal components such as the minimum wage and childcare will be crucial for narrowing down the wealth gap. It is down to the local government to take a call of action, as many of us plead. If the government were to impl implement more structured childcare, it would provide a more family friendly working environment. Data from the International Journal of Sociology of the Family concluded that single parents in Hong Kong found it relatively more challenging to perform childcare tasks while balancing work. If more accessible childcare were made available to working families, it would lead to more adjustability in the workforce and improved household income. With that said, children will also be, have, be able to have the necessary support and resources to break intergenerational poverty. Now I'm asking you to volunteer at a local NGO, teach those who need job skills and qualifications, tutor children with low-income families, go to a local housing estate and donate necessities, educate others, spread the message, and make your voice heard. I'd like to end off with a quote from Nelson Mandela. Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it's an act of justice. Thank you.
so perhaps a few, but the gist of it is, if you were to focus primarily on one type of deep exploration, it could lead to a more efficient pursuit for the answers we seek. Simple enough, right? All you must decide on then is which we choose. I've spoken quite a lot about space, and personal affiliations aside, rightfully so. Despite the fact that our oceans cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface, over 80% of them remain unexplored. In fact, and you've made a difference before, it is often claimed that we know more about the surface of Mars and the Moon than we do about the ocean floor on our own planet. And while this can be justified by the endless amount of things we can discover in outer space, on the other hand, ocean exploration seems to be similarly or even equally as beneficial. After all, we really have no idea what's hanging out at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. But there are solid reasons to think that the prospects for biological novelty and perhaps even companionship for humanity are better down there than they are on Mars. From medicinal seaweed to potential cure for cancer and in deep sea fish adaptations, we simply do not know. At the end of the day, that's it. We do not know. At the moment, NASA is eating up a significant portion of the federal budget of the United States for space exploration, about 0.5%. I won't spout statistics, but truthfully, it makes me wonder whether the space race hype might be largely speculation. Are we really reaching beyond the confines of our galaxy for the sake of what we could find, or for the media? for the publicity, for the story that will sell, the one which will obtain funding, the narrative that will push to private investors really in money and fame, forever plastering our names in the history books. Space is my passion. I've always wanted to be the captivating force that, he, that the human brain bends towards. But the truth is, humanity has a millennia to explore the cosmos. Our planet is heading closer and closer towards Let's face it, an unknown end to potentially all of life. One which we have only centuries, or depending on who you ask, decades to prevent. How can we seek to build a future outside of our planet when there is no future left to complete such explorations? When our time is run out, we won't have an ocean to explore, but we'll always have a universe to fall back upon. Of course, there are complications and exceptions. There is no guarantee of the universe's immortality, but our continued existence on this planet is even more uncertain. So we explore the ocean, but what's next? Is it enough to simply choose? Well, this is where you come in. You, whether as a parent, an educator, a student, an adult, a teenager, a citizen of this planet, you have a choice. I'm not here to preach about the advocacy or that education is the foremost way to obtain funding or results from underwater exploration. Rather, I want to propose a shift in our mindset in terms of the way we look at our planet. With urgency, with a sense of renewed purpose as we diverge into whatever careers we choose. From engineers to biologists to CEOs to teachers, we can all benefit from a world of greater technological, medicinal, but most of all, global advancements, all stemming from the root of life, the ocean. Let's invest time and passion into our planet, whether as an investor, researcher, or simply a citizen of the future. With our planet on thin, thin ice, that is what hangs the balance. Our future, your future. So let's tip the scales and take a gamble. Let's dive into the sea head first before we plunge into the cosmos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Personally, I'm a, I'm, pretty, I'm, a, I'm a pro space person, I don't know. So while I was in the back, I prepared a space joke for you all. So what is money called in space? Starbucks. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Junior Anthony Shen, who will be speaking about the future of education in the world. Uh, I was trying to go with the ice theme, so my picture is taken in Elsa's castle. 
<laughs> when you hear the phrase on thin ice, what image immediately pops into your head? You think of yourself standing on a frozen body of water before you hear a crack. You look down and on the ice there are thin cracks punching the ground on which you stand. But what if I told you we weren't imagining this? That in fact, every single student currently in this room, myself included, is standing on thin ice. And the reason behind all of this, COVID-19. Ah, uh, yeah, I can already see some of you rolling your eyes again. More talk about COVID. Even after the World Health Organization declared that the pandemic is over, it seems that we just can't get on with our normal lives. Don't get me wrong, I would love to do just that. But while it may seem like the world is returning to normal, I'm afraid that the worst is yet to come. The coronavirus pandemic was a long and grueling three-year process filled with unpredictable updates from the government that flipped our normal lives upside down. It affected all of us. Adults lost jobs, the economy suffered, and the government was overwhelmed. However, we must not forget the youth of our world, the kids whose entire world were shaken up by the over 1.6 billion children around the world were forced to learn online, and 250 million students dropped out of school altogether. First, COVID-19 affected our children's development. Daycares, preschool, and even playdates are important settings for children to develop the fundamental social, emotional, and behavioral skills for the future. However, lockdown and isolation meant that many children could not interact with each other, leaving them unable to learn these skills. Studies reinforce this notion. A Brown University study done on 600 children between the ages of three months and three years old found that they scored significantly lower on language, puzzle solving, and motor skills than similar aged children in previous years. If children are being set back on simple skills, such as playing with blocks or even speaking to their parents, who knows how long it might take before they can even attend preschool or pick up and read a book. The pandemic also affected the physical development of our youth's brains. A study from Stanford University found that the pandemic altered the physical age of teenagers' brains, making their brain structures appear several years older than teens before the pandemic. These accelerated brain changes have only been noticed previously in children who have experienced chronic adversity, such as neglect or family dysfunction. Essentially, the pandemic has created a generation of children similar to those experiencing long-term hardship. One of the biggest impacts of this brain change and the pandemic as a whole was mental health issues. The CDC, Center for Disease Control and Pre Prevention, found that the pandemic led to a 5% increase in anxiety, 6% increase in depression, and an increase in self-isolation, social withdrawal, and irrational fears. Thousands of students walk in and out of schools as shells of their own selves, attending classes but only going through emotions. They can't get out of their own head and have a hard time communicating with others. And despite all of these obvious increase in mental health st stressors, schools have actually begun to decrease mental health assessments and tests for children due to budgeting purposes, making it even harder for children to seek help or get treatment. As a student, I saw the effects of the pandemic within my own school, and within my own school as well. While students were able to transition effortlessly online due to HKS being financially well off, the increased use of technology has sadly led many students to lose key social skills that were supposed to be developed in their middle school years. In the grades below me, I've seen a record number of students sitting alone, hunched over, engrossed in their lit up screens, effectively removing themselves from the surroundings. This has also caused ripple effects to the different after-school activities and clubs in my school. We've seen record low numbers of attendance because many students prefer to go home than stay after school for clubs. Secondly, the pandemic has affected our students' education. Although online learning was the best substitute, it's still unable to fully replicate in-person learning. A study by McKinsey & Company found that on average, a COVID-19 student was five months behind in mathematics and four months behind in reading by the end of the year 2021. 
And for those of us sitting in this room, we could be looking at five to six months of lost learning just because of the complexity of Hong Kong's COVID situation. And yes, I use that statistic to tell my mom when I failed my Chinese statistics. <laughs> <laughs> to put that into perspective, as I'm nearing the end of my junior year, my skill set that I have right now is equivalent to the skill set that I was supposed to have at the end of the first semester, almost six months ago. Having in-person school didn't just allow students to grow academically, they also allow students to develop important skills and mindsets that will help them succeed later on in life. In face-to-face -face school, students got to learn about the many social norms in society, like how to speak to people, develop manners, and how to generally learn which behaviors are acceptable and unacceptable in a public setting. But the pandemic took this opportunity from many primary and middle school students. For example, I once saw a kid in a bathroom here at HKS stand there holding a laptop while peeing, which isn't the most respectful or hygienic thing to do, nor do I ever want to touch his laptop again. I can see some of you in the audience are disgusted, and I am too, but this type of behavior is probably a result of a habit developed during COVID. To raise another example, I have to admit, sometimes I really want to strangle some of these ninth graders, not you, Connor, though. But when you put it into perspective, these grade nine students have never had a full year of middle school. Every year, they've been forced to go online. This can explain probably this can probably explain many of their behaviors. We didn't have to worry about our behaviors because we were stuck at home all day. The same way the guy who was holding his computer once in the bathroom while holding it is probably because he did it every single day during the pandemic. <laughs> what makes the problem even worse is that the loss of academic and emotional education can, can all affect one another, creating an intertwined web of potential problems. Poor mental health caused by the pandemic can cause children to fall even further behind in their studies, which can hence lead to worse mental health. COVID caused, by, COVID caused many people to lose sight of the future and hence lose hope. And students falling behind in school are less incentivized to show up to school because they feel like there's no way for them to catch up. Around 800,000 8 to 12 graders could drop out of school due to them falling behind in school or being absent from school during this tough economic period. This isn't a problem that concerns just one country or one region of the world. We are talking about a whole generation of children that are on thin ice. A generation of students that are one second away from falling into the icy cold water. What's even scarier are the consequences that will undoubtedly result if we fail to save our generation's education. Losing education affects all future opportunities, both, both in post-secondary education and job opportunities as a whole. 26% of low-income students have given up on college education because of the pandemic. In the U.S., estimated five months lost of learning will lead to anywhere from 50,000 to 60,000 USD lifetime less earnings for pandemic students and cost the U.S. economy anywhere from 128 billion to 188 billion USD every year. With the world becoming progressively more, ex more expensive, thank you inflation, we can see our current students suffer even more in the future playing with thousands of dollars of debt and being unable to afford even the most basic goods, all due to the education they lost during the pandemic, something entirely out of their control. If we do not address this problem now, we could be sending this generation into the real world unequipped with the skills and knowledge to succeed. Okay, yes, the task of bringing our students up to speed is very difficult and possibly, probably impossible to solve. But there are ways we can mitigate the damage, and it requires each and every one of us to do our part. In order to get an even better understanding of where each school is at, schools need to hire additional teachers, learning specialists, and counselors to make sure that each student is able to get the support that they need within the school and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with trusted adults. Establishing a good connection with teachers not only reduces students' chances of dropping out, but also improves their mental health by giving them someone at school to confide in. We must do everything in our power to prevent these students from forsaking their education. Schools also need to be making changes in the class that reflect the student's level of understanding of the subject. This might mean focusing more on areas where the students struggle or adding more opportunities for students to succeed. For example, they've done that in my math class this year. Instead of making a one test per unit, we now do two because the students are all sadly failing. <laughs> Still, there are certain skills that no class is able to teach 
students. This is where parents play an even more important role in helping students develop these skills. Parents need to fill the social void the pandemic has caused and help their kids learn the key skills in life. As we are faced with such a daunting task of saving a generation's education, parents should continue to be involved in their children's lives. While this may seem like a big ask, the COVID-19 pandemic has left the world on the verge of losing an entire generation's education. It is time to talk about how to save my generation's education. And if we work together as school administrators, as government agents, as teachers, as parents, and as students, to all do our part, I'm sure we will see small changes that change our children's world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 